Welcome to another edition of the A-Pod. Fun chats, fun topics, fun people. I am your host, Ardo Cal. Thank you very much for checking out this podcast. It drops every single Wednesday on msgnetworks.com and iTunes. Hashtag the A-Pod. Been having fun with this podcast. Great guests, great conversations. Some past guests, uh, our first one was a great one. Florida Panthers lawyer by day, viral parody account by night. We've talked to an organist in the NHL. We've talked to the guitarist of a heavy metal band. I'm a big metalhead. That was a great conversation. We talked to a front runner in NHL analytics and gave a analytics 101 lesson and uh, much more. You can check out all the previous episodes uh, on iTunes and msgnetworks.com. Of course, Arda's Words on a Blog drops every Monday at msgnetworks.com. And usually what I do is I give away who the guest on the podcast is on every blog. So Monday's blog, you find out who Wednesday's guest on the podcast will be. I uh, hope you guys have been having a great week. Uh, it is hump day. It is Wednesday. And uh, so far, so good for me. Uh, I was on the last Devils home game broadcast on MSG. It was Devils Islanders at Prudential Center. That was on Saturday. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it was it was an interesting game. Uh, we got to talk uh, Stanley Cup. Uh, we, we, we teased, in fact, the Stanley Cup uh, typos and things like that. So that was a fun segment to get Johnny Max take. Uh, on the whole thing. Patrick Eliash was there, of course. Uh, hashtag Patty's last lap. Uh, he is retiring. His number will be retired next season. And uh, there was a big ceremony. And it was very appropriate that the Islanders were playing the Devils because Steven Gianta was there, a longtime Devil, now playing with the Islanders. So he took the ceremonial face-off with his former teammate, Patrick Eliash. Patrick's daughters dropped the ceremonial puck. It was a very cool moment on the ice. And even Islanders fans, and I got to give some respect to Islanders fans here because even they were standing and uh, showing some respect to Eliash, uh, a player that never played with the Islanders. In fact, he never played with any other team but the New Jersey Devils, um, one of the Islanders' hated teams, uh, a local rivalry, of course. And for Islanders fans to stand up and applaud respectfully, this moment, uh, you got to give them credit. So uh, that's what I'm doing right here. So props to you Islanders fans uh, who traveled to Prudential Center and uh, showed that respect because that was cool. So actually keeping in theme with the Stanley Cup typos, uh, Monday's Arda's words on the blog was 10 random facts you may not have known about the Stanley Cup trophy. So you can check that out on the website. And our guest this week is the face of the Stanley Cup, so to speak. He is known as the keeper of the cup. There are many of them, but he is the main one, so to speak. Uh, He is also a vice president at the Hockey Hall of Fame. His name is Philip Pritchard. Uh, He is the most well-known keeper of the cup. That's the best way to say it. There are several of them. We get into that in the conversation, but this is a great chat. Uh, If the Stanley Cup had a voice The keeper of the cup would be it. The keeper of the cup is always with the Stanley Cup, always traveling with it, making sure that it doesn't get stolen and it looks perfectly presentable and is traveling with the cup. And oftentimes the cup gets dented and drops and the keeper of the cup is always there uh, for real-time fixes and whatnot. So there's a lot of great stories about where the cup has been, what players have done with the Stanley Cup when they've won it. Every player, of course, since 95 uh, gets an official day with the Stanley Cup. So we talk about all that. There's some great stories in there. There's uh, uh, the process on how all of that gets scheduled and organized. So definitely check that out. That's coming up a little bit later on our chat with Phil Pritchard, the keeper of the cup. You guys know I'm definitely a a fan of stand-up comedy. My girlfriend and I definitely love watching stand-up comedy live and specials. This past Friday on Netflix, uh, Louis C.K. dropped the new special on Netflix. It was good. Uh, Definitely dark. Uh, I love the way that uh, Louis constructs sentences. He's definitely... There's no question he's one of the best performers in the world. The way that he unfolds a story and tells a story and also constructs his sentences in particular are, is just off the charts. He's just hilarious. And so uh, no surprise there. Uh, but I will say that uh, my girlfriend's a teacher and we were watching this around 9 p.m. And anybody who's a teacher can definitely relate to this. Uh, she fell asleep. She fell asleep uh, during the special 
Uh, I don't know if that is indicative of the funniness of the special itself or whether nothing would keep her awake, but she fell asleep. So it's worth noting. And that's all I'm going to say. And by the way, Netflix changed their rating uh, structure. It's not stars anymore. It's thumbs up, thumbs down. And I don't think you can see how many thumbs up and how many thumbs down other people have voted this special. And that bothers me. I want to know what other people think of something I'm about to watch. It may or may not affect whether I'm going to continue to watch it. Maybe Netflix thought that that wasn't the best way to go. Maybe they said, you need to formulate your own opinion, so we're taking away the star rankings. I don't know. I don't like that. I like the star rankings. I get the whole thumbs up, thumbs down thing. I prefer the stars. I prefer seeing other people's opinions. Let's put it that way. Maybe if there were comments like Amazon, maybe if there were comments, I would I would appreciate that. Or maybe if there was a way to see how many people voted thumbs up and thumbs down. There's no thumbs in the middle either. It's just you like it or you don't. So you can't give something three stars if you thought it was average. It's only you liked it, a five-star rating, presumably thumbs up, or a zero-star rating, thumbs down. And that's it. Not feeling that right now. I tell you what I am feeling, though. Big fan of fast food over here. Uh, Don't know if you heard this story, but there is a guy on Twitter who tweeted Wendy's. His name is Carter Wilkerson. He tweeted Wendy's and he said, Yo, Wendy's, how many retweets for a year of free nuggets? And Wendy's actually responded and they said 18 million. That's all they wrote. They wrote back to Carter's tweet and they said 18 million. Basically, the gauntlet was thrown down. 18 million retweets and you will get free nuggets for a year. And Carter said, challenge accepted. And he threw out a tweet saying, please help me out, and took a screen grab of this Twitter exchange between him and Wendy's. And the last time I checked, this tweet has gotten 1.5 million retweets thus far. 1.5 million retweets. The most retweeted thing on Twitter ever is Ellen's Oscar selfie, which is, the last time I checked, at 3.2 million. And Carter Wilkerson of Reno, Nevada... By simply asking Wendy's for free McNuggets, pardon me, free nuggets for a year, has gotten over 1.5 million retweets. And you know what? I hope he gets to 18 million because I'd love to see Wendy's have to give him free nuggets for a year. I hope that Carter does something nice with that too. I hope he does some acts of kindness and gives away a lot of those nuggets because I'm pretty sure he doesn't need nuggets for an entire year. And some heavy hitters have retweeted this. Some people that are followed in the millions, like uh, the famous gamer, uh, the the streamer, uh, PewDiePie. He has 9.8 million followers on Twitter, and he's retweeted this, so he's joined the fight. And I'm sure many other celebrities have seen this. I don't know who else has retweeted it, but I'm certain that this has been passed around. Just makes me laugh what, what goes viral. Who would have thought that somebody simply asking a brand for something for free for an entire year and the brand responding would cause a viral sensation. That's basically what happened here. And it's pretty hilarious. I hope he gets it. Now, if I were another brand, I I said McNuggets earlier, if I were McDonald's, I would swoop in at the 2 million retweet mark. I said 1 million, but they haven't on Twitter. I said 1 million, but they haven't swooped in yet. But I would have swooped in by now and said, hey, we're impressed with a million or two million retweets, we'll give you free McNuggets for a month. Just come to McDonald's and tweet some pictures. I would have just swooped in, but I don't work at McDonald's, so. Uh, Speaking of fast food, we all love the fries in the bag. The bonus fries, if you will. When you order some fries, you take it to go, and then you pull the fries out of the bag, and then there's like maybe a five or six fries left in the bag and we always think that they're extra fries that we won it was like we won the lottery like a ten dollar lottery ticket or something like that it always feels great the bonus fries i gotta give a shout out i haven't been to five guys in a long time and i went to five guys uh this past weekend and i have to say they are owning the bonus bonus fries market they have gotten a terrific strategy. I know that they've been doing this for a while because I remembered them doing this from the last time I went, which was probably months and months ago. But still, it's worth noting that they have destroyed and done a great job with the bonus fries market. 
they give you the appropriate amount of fries, whether it's small or large. And honestly, if you order a small, you almost get the equivalent of a large because it's like they put an extra shovel full of fries into your bag. So you have ample bonus fries and it taps into that human emotion of happiness. It's like a, it's like a mind hack that they've discovered and they've really capitalized on it. Because now I want to go to Five Guys again because I'm, I know I'm going to get extra fries. I also love that you can eat free peanuts while waiting for your food. Some great gimmicks all around at Five Guys. Speaking of Five Guys, I don't know if it's five people that are the keepers of the cup, but let's get to that interview. It's a very interesting interview. And like I mentioned, the latest artist words on the blog at msgnetworks.com, it's up now and you can check it out, is 10 random facts about the Stanley Cup trophy. And we talk about a lot of things, all things related to the Stanley Cup trophy itself with the most famous keeper of the cup. His name is Philip Pritchard. Let's get to that interview right now. All right, we're joined now by uh, this guest I'm really excited to talk to because uh, there are a lot of stories uh, that we're going to get into uh, that I cannot wait to hear about. Uh, He is known as the keeper of the cup. Uh, and his name is Philip Pritchard. He's also the Vice President, uh, Resource Center, and Curator of the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, Phil, thank you very much for taking time today. Hey, it's always great to talk to you. It's, uh, you know what, we're getting close to playoff time and, and everyone's talking hockey, which is great. Is this the calm before the storm? Because I guess uh, the Stanley Cup has to make its uh, rounds uh, during the playoffs. Yeah, you know, it's... Uh I mean, obviously, hockey, it seems to be a 12-month-a-year sport now, which is great for all those hockey fans. So we do a lot of uh, tours during the season uh, for charities, for team stuff, for league stuff and that. But like you said, it is we're closing in on playoffs, and there's 16 teams going to be, uh, hopefully one of them was going to be winning the Stanley Cup. And then that storm will come to fruition, and... It'll be a great summer for them. So, uh, yeah, I guess in a way it is It is gearing up to the biggest moment in hockey. Uh, but there's a long way to go before that happens. So I, I have a lot of questions about that. But the first thing I want to do is I, I want to hear your journey uh, through hockey. I, I, is it true you were born and raised in Oakville? I was, oh, yes. I as well. That's awesome. We got something in common. Perfect. <laughs> I, actually live in Bur- I actually live in Burlington now. Though. Oh, wow. City over. Isn't that isn't yeah. that a, isn't that a taboo to grow up in Oakville and to now live in Burlington? It's like competing suburbs. Of yeah, Toronto. but I, I ended up going to school in Burlington and that, and then I went to college back in uh, Oakville at Sheridan College, though. So. Oh wow. Okay. So how did you uh, tell me your earliest memories of hockey? How did you discover it, and how did you fall in love with it? Well, you know what? I, it's funny you say that because my uh, my family is British, and they moved over. Uh, right after my mom and dad got married, and they wanted a, a better life in in North America, because they moved to Canada, so hockey really wasn't in our in our bloodline. Uh, I got into it. We lived in a dead end street, and every day people would go out on the road and start playing road hockey. So, you know, I tagged along. I collected hockey cards just like everyone else did. All at an early age, we all grew up loving hockey in the National Hockey League, and then years later, which kind of is the circle of life thing uh, when I started working here at the Hockey Hall of Fame and researching more and finding out about Lord Stanley and his history and everything. He's from uh, Preston, England, which is the town over which are where my parents are from. <laughs> oh, wow, what a connection. Yeah, which is, I mean, <laughs> kind of kind of unique in a way. But, hey, uh, Lord Stanley and the Stanley Cup is unique in its own way. So you went to Sheridan College. What did you study there? I studied of all things accounting, graduated from there with your accounting. <laughs> Glad to see that you're putting the degree to good use. Yeah, whatever you get there. And then I thought, nothing against accountants, but I don't think I can do this forever. So well, I, went back to, I went back to my high school and spoke to our student counselors, and they said, why are you doing that? Why didn't you take sports? You love the sports behind the scenes. So they convinced me to go to Durham College in Osho, which was a sports administration program. I, I, that was that was a big a big plus and a a big thank you. I I owe my high school student services to convince me to go there. I guess in a way you hold uh, you're accountable for the Stanley Cup, so I guess there's a mild connection there. In a <laughs> I way. like that one. That's a good. <laughs> I don't know if uh, 
any accountants will buy that, but that's a good one, though. <laughs> so tell me... You know what I... What's that? I, I uh, from Durham, it was a co-op, and my co-op was with the Ontario Hockey League and the Canadian Hockey League at their head office. So I got into the, uh, the office environment of the business of hockey at, at the league office level, and coincidentally enough, Dave Branch, who is the commissioner still of the OHL and the Canadian Hockey League, was uh, on the board at the Hockey Hall of Fame. And it kind of went from there. So I guess you look back, I kind of stepped up or stepped down, depending on which way you want to look at it, to the Hall of Fame. And that was back in September 88 now, so 20, 29 years ago. So that happened pretty quickly in your career. You, you went literally from the OHL to the Hockey Hall of Fame. What was your first job there? Uh, at the Hockey Hall of Fame, I was uh, kind of looked after marketing promotion in the gift shop, but I, my love was research and, and the collectibles and that. And I remember my first week on the job, it was a, I started on a Monday, and on the Friday, the Stanley Cup had to go up to Newmarket to uh, uh, Hockey Registration Day. They were doing a special thing, and the Cup was going up to Newmarket. My boss at the time, Scotty Morrison, had said anyone want to uh, go up to Newmarket and nobody put up their hand uh, so I did and and Jeff Denemy one of the other co-workers said I'll go as well so me and him took the Stanley Cup up to Newmarket and I guess I've been putting my hand up ever since so within a week you essentially week, I've, unofficially I've, became the keeper of the cup yeah I've got the cup in the back of my uh, my old vehicle I had then it was a hatchback <laughs> And we drove up. It was a great event and the opportunity to talk to everybody about hockey and their history and their memories and who their idols were and everything. It was awesome then and it's still awesome now, Arda. Is that, uh, is that security behind us uh, making sure the cup is safe? I, I believe so. <laughs> I believe it is. So tell me. But you know what? It, it, it's funny because you, you mentioned about security and safety and all that and, and those are two of the biggest things that we look at when we're traveling with the Stanley Cup is it's hockey history. It's the probably, if you to ask any player, the most important part of hockey is the Stanley Cup. So to be able to travel with it and make sure it's safety in that, it, it's, a, it's a new chapter every day. So now there, obviously there's a giant, uh, what is it, a giant safety box or a container that the Stanley Cup travels in. What was it like uh, in the early days? How did, how did the Stanley Cup go from place to place? Like that, that, that well, trip we, in Newmarket, how did, you con uh, how did you transport the Stanley Cup? Well, we did have a case then. It, I mean, it did still have a traveling case. And, and like all museums, we have uh, artifact cases and travel cases for everything. So the Stanley Cup was no different. Uh, it is, we go through probably one every couple of years now. And it's amazing because we've kept them all since way back then. And obviously the game has changed. The case hasn't changed as well. But it, it's it's amazing because there's no uh, there's no name on it or it says it's Stanley Cup, but the diehard hockey fans always know what it is. So uh, b before we get to all the questions about the Stanley Cup, can you tell me more about uh, the other duties that you have with the Hockey Hall of Fame? Because you, you, the title is Vice President, Resource Center, and Curator. I imagine you have a lot. You wear many hats at the Hockey Hall of Fame. <laughs> wear many hockey helmets. We don't wear hats. Here. <laughs> Very well played. <laughs> you know what? As a curator here. I, I'm fortunate to look after basically the hockey sides of the Hockey Hall of Fame, the exhibits, the displays, getting artifacts, uh, donations, the research part, the, the archives, and the resource center. And by being the curator there, you look after all the artifacts we have in the d collection, which include the National Hockey League trophies and, of course, the Stanley Cup. So it, it all kind of ties in together. And to be able to uh, go to work, and I think anyone that goes to work that loves their job, it's not really a job. And I, I think I fall in that category. I love, love reading about hockey, love hearing stories from people, love going out on the road uh, and meeting people and, and celebrating their, their moments with them. It, it, it is, uh, it's a great sport, and it's great to be involved in. Is there any, uh, is there any artifact or any historical uh hockey piece of lore that you found recently maybe a story you could share about that well you know what it's amazing because hockey history is happening every day regardless whether it's the nhl junior leagues uh, major leagues what have you and there's there's always unique things coming around 
and recently we've got some some old sticks from the late 1800s. We got a we actually got a 1893 Stanley Cup ring from the first year the Stanley Cup was presented. The team made seven rings for the players because there was only seven guys on the team at that time, and Billy Barlow was the player, and his daughter actually had it and wanted to make sure that it was preserved forever. So we're we're thrilled to have the first Stanley Cup ring ever. And we have the most recent one from the Pittsburgh Penguins also, and we have a whole bunch in between. But I think every story of every artifact, if each one of them could talk, it could tell you something about the game of hockey and, and what it stands for. And I, I think that being a curator, that's, that makes your job so interesting to find out the story behind the story. That's fascinating. I want to get to uh, the Stanley Cup. I think a lot of people listening to this podcast will want to hear a lot of stories about the Cup. Uh, so there's, it, it, you are known uh, probably most publicly as the keeper of the Cup, but there's actually a team of you. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, I, I guess I kind of got the title because I'm the old guy or the veteran or the experienced <laughs> guy, <laughs> however you want to look at it. <laughs> I, I say the experienced guy. But yeah, I mean, there, there are... Obviously, there's more than just me. It, the Cup is on the road probably close to 300 days a year. And it's, it's always out and around. Uh, but it, it's promoting the game, and, and all of us keepers of the Cups or Cup keepers or whatever you want to call us are, are pride ourselves in what we do because, it's as we know, the, the Cup is the, the ultimate in hockey. Anybody that picks up a hockey stick or puts on skates wants to play in the greatest league in the world, the National Hockey League, and ultimately hoist the Stanley Cup over their head. So to be that close to it, it's, it's special for all of us. I imagine people listening to this would love to know how one becomes a keeper of the Cup. How, how do you train to become one? Well, well, if you talk to my wife, she'll say I was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. <laughs> Should have been a hockey player. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It, it's, it's funny that you've asked that because people often ask that and that. And we're always, like any any uh, job out there, people are always looking to improve themselves, and we're always looking for staff, just like any other position in that, and, and it comes around. Uh, Mike Bolt, one of the cup keepers, has been with us almost 20 years now. Walter Newbrand has been around 24 years. Uh, Howie Burrow has been around 10. So the guys that we have are, are pretty well mainstay guys, but hey, we're always open to uh, other suggestions, just like most most places are out there in that. Uh, I think each one of us provide a, a uniqueness to it. And uh, at the end of it all, we're, we're kind of behind the scenes guys and the, the three foot high silver object is the focal point though. I imagine once you accept the job of keeper of the cup, when you join that team, it's probably not a job you're gonna be giving up anytime soon. Well, it's you know, it, it's <laughs> funny because hang out with the winners first of all which is which is always good there's not very many sad facers or nobody's sm not smiling when you show up with the Stanley Cup and that makes uh, a job very I don't want to say stress for you fr stress free but very unique in its way and, and anybody that has that opportunity that goes into their job and someone's always smiling uh, it, it, it makes the job so special and, and we're fortunate what for what we do and everyone else in their jobs, whatever they might do, whether they're handing out free ice cream cones at schools or whatever it is that makes everyone smile, it, it's great. And, and I think we're lucky to be in that situation. So just to give everyone a scope of how popular the Stanley Cup is, how, how many requests uh, for the Stanley Cup to appear at events, uh, you know, locally or internationally, how, how many requests would you say come in a week? Uh, we probably get about 3,000 a year. Wow. But out of that, and it's pretty amazing, we probably get 500 to 700 events we do in a year because we often do more than once in a day. So that, I mean, our, our ratio to requests and fulfillment are pretty high, I think. But I, I always think the neat thing about it, or the coolest thing about it for hockey fans, is you never know where it's going to be because we have our schedule during the hockey season of we might be going to the All-Star game or to a minor league tour or a United States Hockey League banquet or, or something like that. But when the players have it, we go back to their hometowns and a lot of them kind of go, oh, I want to go here or I want to go see my first coach. So it, it's all different places. 
and you're just running to people that all of a sudden, holy smokes, there's a Stanley Cup sitting in line <laughs> at the coffee shop or, or wherever we might be going. And I, I think that's what makes those reactions so special. So sure, we get lots of requests in that, and and it would be great to fulfill them all. Unfortunately, we can't, but it's it's those moments when we see the people that haven't seen it before and they the surprise on their face and their smile on their face sees it, it it's so special where's the most remote or random place uh that either you or another keeper has taken the stanley cup uh I, I'll, I'll have a couple actually I'll, I'll give you one with a player pavel datsuk from the detroit red wings is from uh ekaterinburg russia which is on the siberian russian border in the ural mountains so it's a long way from Toronto <laughs> and a long way from New York. So there's no direct flights going to Siberia from North America. You're, you're going through Frankfurt or Paris and then on to Moscow and then up. Uh, but it's amazing because of social media now, the interest they have in it. And I don't know if remote's the right word anymore because of the Internet. Uh, but in saying that, for Pavel, it was it was a unique day. But we we do a lot without players as well, and do promotions. Later on in April, actually, we're doing a, a First Nations tour up in the Arctic Circle in northern Canada, and so we're going to reach out to those those little villages and hamlets that can't really get down to the, as they call it the south down to to Toronto or New York area or somewhere to see an NHL game. We're going up there to surprise them. So. All of these places that are remote, you, you actually can get to nowadays and, and surprise people. And hey, hockey's played in over 75 countries around the world, so they're all thrilled when you get a chance to see the Stanley Cup, no matter where we are. I remember I uh, had a chance to visit a Callowit once in none of it, and uh, it was funny. I was saying, man, it's so beautiful here up north, and the locals were saying, up north? This isn't up north. There's even more up north than this. And I was just, yeah. it made me remind me when you said that. Because I'm sure that they will love uh, that would be amazing. I, didn't it, did it not go to? I think it was like 2001. It went to Rankin Inlet. Yeah, it went to Rankin Inlet. And actually, you mentioned the Callaway there because that's our starting point. We're we're all meeting there and then going from there. So we're going, I think Resolute Bay, Pond Inlet. Like we're going really up north. You know when it, when the name of the city is, or when the name of the town says Resolute, you know that it's <laughs> out there. It's that, exactly. But I think what the great part is, wherever it is, whether it's the Arctic Circle or whether it's down south on the Mexican border or, or uh, Japan or wherever we might be, and we've been to 25 countries, it's uh, that three-foot-high, 35-pound trophy is, is pretty popular because it's, it's one of a kind. It's unique. Every player that had the opportunity to win it, they have their name on it or their team name on it. And I think that's what makes it extra special when people see it, whether it's the first time or their 50th time. Okay, I want to uh, talk about players' days with the cup. Uh, so take me through this entire process. When, what year, I, I've, I've seen conflicting years online. What year did that, that, that official tradition of every Stanley Cup winning player getting a day with the cup, what year did that officially begin? Well, the, it officially began in 1995 where every player on the team got the opportunity to take it to their hometown. That was with the New Jersey Devils. Prior to that, the Day with the Cup kind of evolved over probably 10 years before that, from the 80s when the Oilers were winning the Cup and a lot of the guys took it home. Then the Penguins uh, won the Cup in the early 90s. A lot of those guys took it home. In 93, the Montreal Canadiens won the Cup. It was also the 100th anniversary of the Stanley Cup. And the Canadians did a tour of Quebec that summer with the Cup because uh, there was two teams in Quebec at the time, the Quebec Nordiques and the Montreal Canadiens, and they wanted everyone in Quebec to follow the Canadians. So they did a tour with all a lot of their players who were French-Canadian at the time. There was a couple of guys that weren't. Jean Leclerc, who was from Vermont, and Kirk Muller was from Kingston. So we reached out to them and said, hey, we should take it to their hometowns as well. So this whole... Uh, day with the Cups thing started evolving and evolving. Then the next year, in 94, the Rangers won. And thank goodness for the Rangers. They got it on the front page of the Times and the Post, I think, every day during that summer. <laughs> As Mark 
Messier was here, or Nick Caprios was there, or Mike Richter was there. So it was, it was at about that time that we started really sitting down with the league and trying to evolve this out into what we didn't know then that would become uh, one of the greatest traditions in sport. Now, was it also 1995 that the official Keeper of the Cup position was, was made into an official job? Yeah, I guess because, you know what, the Keeper of the Cup has just become a title by fans more than anything. Okay. And, and they've called us that. I, like I said, I, I started traveling with the Cup in 88, and we went to all different tournaments. We went to the All-Star game with it, and we always looked after it and always traveled with it and that. But it, I think it became... I don't know what you want to call it, more media involvement or more visible uh, in 95 when everyone got that opportunity to take the cup home and they they kind of had a spokesperson for it and the cup couldn't talk. So by default, we kind of told the stories. So is it a 24-hour period that the players get, like from 6 in the morning to 6 in the morning? Or like how does that, how does that day shake out for them? Well, actually, it's a day. And the day could be 18 hours, it could be 8 hours, I don't know. We have to work that out with the team, and geography and travel plays a huge part in it. Uh, but first of all, we have to look at the calendar, because the team wins, say, middle of June, and their opening day is probably early October. So they've got about three and a half months in there, maybe less, say 100 days, in there to look after everybody, but they also have a bunch of commitments, as does the league and as does the town that win it. So we ha we base it from there. So we try, if we're in, let's say, eastern United States, in New York, Massachusetts, New England area, we try and get all those days in a row as much as possible so we can give the guys as much time as, as they deserve. Obviously, they're Stanley Cup champions, and they, they have a whole bunch of ideas they want to do. It, it becomes tough when we're going to Russia, then Sweden, then northern Canada, then down to Minnesota, then up to British Columbia, and all those travel times come out of that 100 days. Like, we, we eventually are going to run out of time. <laughs> so geography and uh, flight schedule or train schedule or bus, whatever it might be, is so, so important in that June when we're sitting down with the team and their PR staff and their team travel guys to make this all work. I was going to say, so it, it back, sounds back like... Back to the 24 hours, some guys get that, some guys, because of the way it works out, get eight. You know, it's, it's all different. We just try, try and say a day with a cup, and their day with a cup was going to be awesome, no matter what it is. It, it sounds like you need an entire situation room to organize this for a summer. <laughs> exactly. And you know what? I, that's great. That situation room is so right, because we basically get a map of the world out, and the the team that has it has pins all over where all their guys are from because they obviously already know they're their hometowns. And then we start figuring out geographically and kind of put it into, in the segments. Okay, we can do the Western Canadian guys here, and then we got to get here and stuff like that. So it's uh, there's always some unique travel days and some sleepless nights and some bags under our eyes and that. But at the end of it, like we were saying, we are, uh, we so look forward to making sure these guys, whether it's the players, coaching staff, equipment staff, whoever, get as much out of their day as they can because they're the Stanley Cup champions and they've earned that right. So we're there to help them along the way and, and it's usually a great day. So I, so I guess I, I wanted to ask that as well. So the players definitely get time, the coaching staff does. Who, uh, are there any other, I guess, employees of the team that receive a day as well? Well, again, that all breaks down to that 100 days. Okay. Depending on how much time it is, because you gotta keep in mind we, ha we have the team parade, they've got the team photos, they have sponsors, they have season ticket holders. They all gotta get looked after in there as well. They've got a roster of somewhere between 23 and 30 players, if you include the uh, Black Aces and that. Uh, there's the coaching staff, all the guys on the bench, the scouts, the owners, the president. I mean, the, the staff gets pretty big, and all of a sudden your 100 days goes pretty fast. So in some cases they have, uh, say, public relation team parties or something where two or three of them have it at the same 
time and invite their friends over and do photos and have a dinner together and stuff. But it's all, uh, and I'm going to go back to my accounting here because it's all <laughs> mathematical and accounting and try to make things work and how many times do we have and what's an asset here and our days are depleting and stuff. And it, it's always a fun time in June trying to make this work. So hockey players are a superstitious bunch, and I'm sure that you've had many situations where one player won the Stanley Cup and maybe their brother or a good friend who's also in the NHL who didn't win the Stanley Cup, they're there uh, supporting their family or their friend. What, how do they act when they see the Stanley Cup and they didn't win it, but they're there at that party? It, it's, it's, it's amazing, actually, because first of all, you've got the bond of your, your brother's and your family and that, and, and that's the biggest bond in the world. So you, obviously they're thrilled for little brother or big brother or twin or whatever it might be. Uh, case in point would be the Stahl brothers. Four of them playing in the NHL, two of them have won the cup so far. And uh, Eric was the first one to win the cup and brought it home, and Jordan and, and Mark and uh, Jane were just starting then at the time. So they were in all the family photos and that. Eric was the one carrying it around. And then a few years later, Jordan won it with Pittsburgh in 2009, brings it back home. And, and uh, Mark and Jaden, everyone's career is kind of expanding a bit more. But there they're was a family thing. So mom and dad, they're all part of it. They spent the whole day with it. But they knew, or like the guys that hadn't won it, that, hey, we're still out there working for this and our, our hopefully our goal will come one day that we get to bring the Stanley Cup home as a family member. Is it like they don't touch it or they don't look at it? Like it, how superstitious do these players get if they uh, don't win it? They're, they're in all the family photos for sure. Okay. Uh, are they carrying it around? No. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. Are they still for Big Brother Eric and Jordan? By all means. It's, it's a great moment for their, for their family and for their brother uh, so that on those days, it's it's kind of unique. Uh, when you talk to them after, they'll express their their gratitude for them being there and their their happiness for their brother. But at the end of it, they want their name on it too. So speaking of names, how uh, is it? Is it fifty two? That's the number of names that are allowed to go into Stanley Cup per team. It is. It's uh, fifty two that'll fit on there, and it, it's amazing. You look back over the years. And even the game of hockey has evolved, the Stanley Cup has evolved. You, you look at the names and how they evolve now. Now in the NHL, there's people with hyphen names. Uh, there's more Eastern Europeans, so some of the names are longer than that. So that 52 it gets tight sometimes. And the team's got to work that out and get it okayed by the league and everything and on who's going on from the owner all the way down to the backup goalie and beyond. So the, 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 the team is the one that presents uh, you guys with the 52 names. Here's the 52 names we would like on the cup uh, within yeah, the rules. We have to sign off on it through the NHL to make sure that the players they listed all actually played. Uh, they were all part of a team, that the management were all part of it, the owners are the actual owners and things like that. So just to make sure that it's all formalized and the I's dotted and T's crossed and everything. And then it goes to the silversmith in Montreal, Quebec, and she has about close to 10 days with it because each letter gets hand stamped on there. And once it's on there, it's on there forever. I'm sure a lot of listeners want to hear about the, uh, I know that there are some very famous, uh, I guess, mishaps or mistakes and uh, misspellings on the Stanley Cup. The, the one I want to start with is the Basil Pocklington one because I've heard different stories about it being there, then not being there, then being there again. Can you clarify that for us? Well, it is on there. It's probably the most infamous name on the Stanley Cup because it's crossed out. <laughs> and, it, and it happened back in the 80s when the Oilers were winning the Cup, and Basil Pocklington is Peter Pocklington's dad, who used to be the owner of the Oilers. Peter was. And thought it'd be great to have his dad on the Cup. At that time, you didn't have to uh, send the names over to the league and the hall to get approved. It was a, kind of like you're on your honor system. So, you know, Peter, as the owner of the team, thinks, say, hey, here's the list we want to have, and I'm, my dad's pretty important to me in my life, which is great, and I, I hope everyone's father is important to him like that. Uh, the thing that got, 
that happened out of it all. It got engraved on there, and then the league saw it, and the Hall of Fame saw it, and thought, this isn't right. We can't have this, because who knows what will happen. So we couldn't erase it, because it's done on silver, so we had to exit out. So when you see the Stanley Cup and you go to the Oilers in the 80s, you'll see a name that's X'd out. So although he's not on there, he's probably the most infamous name that is on there. That's amazing. So what happens today then? Let's just say, I, I, and I don't want to take anything away uh, from, uh, her name is Louise, right? Uh, the, the, the one that stamps the names in Montreal? Louise Yeah. Her so, name is, yeah. She's the silversmith, and it's, uh, it's funny, Art, because she's been, uh, she's a family tradition that has been going on for years and it goes to her usually in late September so the the amazing thing is when the guys get their day with the cup their name is not on it because they need 10 days we can't take 10 days out of their summer because those 10 days now become down to 90 and they might got get everything in so we look after the guys first and then we go get it engraved and when it's done we bring the cup back to the city team has a kind of an unveiling party all the players are there they see their names for the first time it's a pretty emotional moment because family members are there and they know that they're on part of this union that is known as the stanley cup champion and so they're there forever so and I, and I take nothing away that is a very stressful job i can only imagine uh to have 10 days to put all of those names correct spelling everything on the cup but what's the what's the protocol if there happens to be a spelling error today? Because there are some very famous ones that are on the cup, but what happens if, let's say, there was a misspelling on the Penguins uh, listing? Say Phil Kessel's name was spelt wrong. What happens, what's the protocol today? Well, it, it, it's a good one because if it can get fixed, we will uh, we'll do our best to get fixed. And, and by saying that, maybe it was a letter I that was stamped, and it should have been an L. So you can overstamp that, and and can appear again. Uh, so you can kind of correct the mistake in some situations. Not everyone you can. If it's an X and it's supposed to be an O, you're going to notice that. However, they, we do the best to where we can to. Uh, first of all, human error is part of society, so sometimes it happens. Uh, we keep our fingers crossed, and Louise probably keeps. Her fingers, everything crossed when she's doing it. <laughs> but she's a professional, and she does a great job at it. And I, I think that's what makes the Stanley Cup so unique and so so uh, lifelike in that there that there are blemishes on it, and there are mistakes on it. I, I think when you and I are 125, if we look as good as the Stanley Cup does now, we'll be doing okay. <laughs> No kidding. So what happens when you're on the road and you're, uh, I mean, obviously part of it is you have to take care of the cup. I mean, it's going into places. I mean, I've seen it on top of mountains. It's on the beach. So obviously it's going to get dirty. So tell me some of the between the day stuff that the keepers of the cup have to do to keep it looking pristine every single day when it's presented to the next player. Well, it's, it's amazing you say that because every day we start our day off, whether it's in a hotel or whether it's at the guy's house or whether it's in a farmer's field or whatever, the first thing we do with a cup is clean and shine that cup. So basically we're getting the fingerprints off of it from the day before, so when the next player gets it, it looks as pristine as it did on the ice when he first hoisted it that night. So it's that is a, a regular duty on the keeper of the cup or the cup keeper's day that starts off that day. It goes in professionally to get cleaned twice a year and that's you're done with silver polish. When we clean it, we're basically using just a soft detergent and warm water just to get the fingerprints off, because as we all know, fingerprints have oils in their fingers and we pass it on, so we gotta get it clean. And it looks great, and, and to date, I, I think we've done a pretty good job of it. So what, uh, I, I can only imagine through the travels, through people hoisting it up, wherever it goes, the, the Stanley Cup certainly gets dented. So what's the protocol on either fixing them? I, I, I've read stories online where some keepers have like fixed it on the fly. I mean, tell me about that. Yeah, it, it, is, it is pretty amazing and it's amazing what you do to uh, make things look great because we have <laughs> had to have sometimes accidents happen. It's, uh, it's part of life, unfortunately. So we are 
in the back room sometimes with a, a soft mallet and a towel trying to bang something out or, or something like that because sometimes the table or the leg on a table collapses out of no one's fault and the, the cup tips off. Uh, we've used police officers tools that they have on their belts sometimes. Zamboni drivers always have tools. There's always carpenters around that have tools. And it, it, I think it just adds to that uniqueness and tradition and aura of what the Stanley Cup is and what it represents. If it could, if it could only talk and share every day with it, it would be a bestseller for years. Hmm. You've been very generous with your time, Phil. I only have a couple questions left. I definitely have to ask about uh, crazy days with the Cup. Uh, from your travels, decades with the Stanley Cup, and players who are so happy to have it after they've won the Stanley Cup, uh, what has been the craziest player day with the Stanley Cup? Uh, craziest player day. <laughs> that one I don't know. I, I, I always look at Timo Solani in, in Finland, outside of Helsinki, and... His day was so unique because, first of all, he was, he was the only Finnish player on the Ducks to win that year. So we went back to Finland. There was only two Europeans on the Ducks. Eli Brzgalov was the other one, and he was from the middle of Russia. So when you go to Europe, you do the whole tour in one go. So we were at uh, Solani's, but the only way to get to Samara, Russia, which is where Brzgalov was from, from Finland, the flights only went every couple of days. So Timo's day extended into like two and a half days. And Timo Solani, one of the great guys, good looking hockey players, great hockey player, uh, very loyal to his country in that. He did everything, everything from karaoke parties to cruises on the ocean, <laughs> to uh, a parade in town, to a city hall, getting the key to the city, like everything you can imagine, sauna parties at his cottage, and it just, for him, his championship moment never ended. And finally, we got back to the Helsinki airport and uh, had to get a catch a flight to Moscow and then on to Samara, Russia. But you got on that plane thinking, holy smokes, I, I just experienced the Stanley Cup party, which was probably one of the greatest Finnish hockey players of all time. And it was unbelievable. How many uh, players bring their boys together and do like a ball hockey tournament where the winners get the Stanley Cup? It, it, it's funny uh, you say that because there, there are a lot of ball hockey tournaments and road hockey tournaments, but they, they usually bring their old buddies from back in their uh, junior school or high school days. So there's, there's not very many parties where some of their teammates show up at because it's their day and they don't want to take the spotlight away from their guy, but all their buddies... When they get home, uh, you go back to Nova Scotia, and Sidney Crosby is not the greatest hockey player of all time when you're at his hometown. He's just Sid. And they all have their own internal jokes or whatever it is, and, and it's great that he's not the – he's not he is the Stanley Cup champion, but he's not with his buddies. He's just Sid Crosby that lived down the road. And that's what makes it so great. And any one of us that have our friends from – all the way back in school days. doesn't matter what they do for a living. You're just his buddy, and that's what counts. And these players never forget those guys, and that's who they want to share their days with. So it's, it's so special, especially to meet those guys and hear the stories about them growing up and, you know, everything that kids do in high school and all that kind of stuff, that they're now sharing it in this special moment. What percentage of players would you say either eat or drink out of the Stanley Cup with their day? 90. 90%, 90 wow. Yeah, at least. <laughs> and what percentage would you say put their children in the bowl? Well, uh, hmm. a lot of the players don't have... Of the ones the that have babies, I would say. Let's, let's yeah, say of the ones I, that I have babies. I uh, think the family photo, it's extremely important to them. So if their uh, ch child or children are young enough and they can sit them in there... It's very important to them. Uh, obviously, if the kids are bigger, they can't do that. But the family photo with a cup, it, it always happens. And it, it's always unique when you, you're with a guy that maybe won the cup 10 years ago and he was single then and now he's married and has a family, how the days change and how much more personal the day becomes because he's, he's 
sharing it with his loved ones and his new family and his his children and that and it, it's it's each every day is so special and they're all different. Actually, that that spawns one more question. I have two, two more questions for you. When a guy like Ray Bork wins the Stanley Cup at the twilight of his career and he'd been chasing it the entire time, versus somebody maybe like a Yager that won it in his first year playing in the NHL, what sort of differences do you notice uh, when they have their time with the Stanley Cup? Uh, you know what? For Ray Bork, I mean, it was that moment when Joe Sackett handed Ray Bork the cup in Colorado was so special. And it must have been so much relief for Ray that he finally accomplished it uh, and got that opportunity to bring it home to his friends and family in, in the Boston area. And then you get a younger guy that comes up to the NHL and is at the right time, at the right place. And timing is so important in life, and it, it's certainly that in the Stanley Cup where guys win it. And they might win it in their first year and never make it back to the playoffs again. So they, they see it differently because, hey, I, I hear all these stories about winning the Stanley Cup and how hard it is, and here I am my first year and I get it. This can't be all that bad. And then they realize throughout the career. And I remember talking to Jeremy Roenick once in, uh, I guess it was 80, 88, they got to the finals first year. All right, 90, 90, sorry. Uh, they get to the final. And Jeremy thought, wow, here's our team. We're playing the Penguins. And I get to the final. I'm 19, 18 year old. And he never got back again another 18 years later. And that, that's when he really realized how tough it is to get there. Yeah, and of course, the, the, the famous scene where the Blackhawks finally won the Stanley Cup decades later, and he's an analyst and he's, he's crying. It's so emotional for him to watch. Yeah, exactly. That. Yeah. I, I think there's your great conclusion there the emotions that the Stanley Cup brings. It's unbelievable. Everything from tears to joy to pain, everything in there. And it's all because of this trophy that Lord Stanley gave so many years ago. The last question for you is, do the keepers of the cup also get a day with the Stanley Cup? <laughs> no, we don't. Our, uh, our day is shared with the winners, which is <laughs> just fine by me. Because to hang out with them and to see it all and be part of it, and at the beginning of the day, show up at their house and kind of, you know, introduce yourself. And it's kind of those awkwardness the first few minutes when you really get to meet guys. And at the end of the day, when you uh, thank the guy and everything, and, and he comes over and says, what a great day. I'm glad you were a part of it. Makes it all worthwhile. Cause that, that's the day of the cup for me. That's all I need. Phil, I want to thank you very much for being so gracious with your time. This was a very enlightening conversation. We learned a lot. And it's always nice to talk to a fellow Oakvillian. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll see you in Oakville one day. My family owns Brawny Fish and Chips on Lakeshore. Come back. We'll oh, I will. I'm, next time I'm in Oakville, I will stop by. <laughs> All right. Thank, Super, Arda. Thank you, Phil. Hey, Take let's care. let's keep in touch anytime. If we can do something over the summer, let's chat. Absolutely. Take care. So there you have it, a great conversation with Phil Pritchard, the keeper of the cup, fellow Oakvillian from Oakville, Ontario, which is a suburb, a 20 or 30 minute drive depending on traffic, west of downtown Toronto, along Lake Ontario. Ah, Oakville. Shout out to White Oak Secondary School, where I went to high school. Phil didn't go to high school in Oakville. He went to high school in Burlington, which is uh, the city over to the west. It goes Toronto, Etobicoke. Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington, Hamilton. And that's all along Lake Ontario. So there you have it, some Toronto-centric Canadian geography. Congratulations to all of us. We, we've made it, guys. We've made it. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this podcast. Thank you to Phil Pritchard, the keeper of the cup. Uh, one of the keepers of the cup, pardon me, and vice president of Hockey Hall of Fame for coming on to the podcast and giving us some really cool stories and anecdotes and information about the Stanley Cup trophy, which will be decided in the coming months. The Stanley Cup playoffs are here, and it is my favorite time of the year as a sports fan. In my humble opinion, the Stanley Cup playoffs are the most exciting postseason in sports. And I cannot wait to enjoy it all as a fan of hockey, watching every game 
it's going to be a blast. And I'm sure that many of you listening will as well. Uh, we actually recorded a podcast, sort of like a MSG Hockey Show After Hours recap. And that will be coming to uh, the A-Pod very soon with my co-hosts Will Reeve and Anson Carter. We are gone for the summer. It's been a blast, and we have some fun stories to share there, so keep checking the timeline for that podcast. Also, some future podcasts include a fellow MSG Networks broadcaster and a contributor to the Today Show and 75 other things, an Emmy winner, a uh, Guinness World Record holder, Jill Martin. Uh, we'll be talking with her in the coming future. Mr. Devil himself, Ken Danico, a very interesting conversation. That guy is an expert storyteller. He is a captivating individual, and he's got a lot of stories to share. So that podcast is coming very soon. As well, uh, for you fellow gamers out there, I had a chance to speak with the author of Console Wars, Blake J. Harris. We talk all about how NHL 94, the game that won our Ice Madness tournament, uh, how that game was created. He wrote a long blog piece about the creation of that game, talked to a lot of the producers of that game uh, and, and creators, and also we talk about the formative years of video games, particularly the Sega versus Nintendo wars of the 90s, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis. Anybody who was a big video game fan or a retro video game fan will love this podcast. So that will all be coming very soon to the A-Pod. Keep checking the listings and please subscribe on iTunes. Please feel free to leave a five-star rating and a comment. Uh, you can still leave star ratings, unlike Netflix, on iTunes. <laughs> but if you leave a, a rating like that and you leave a comment, it helps the iTunes algorithm in the behind the scenes. And that's how people find the podcast more. It'll be listed on, on noteworthy lists and rankings, etc. So I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the length and taking the time to do that as well. And of course, Art is Words on the blog every single Monday at msgnetworks.com. You can follow me on Twitter at ArtoCalTV. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.